Ms. Courtney, why don't you first start with your full name, you know, is what, what you do, um, tell our audience a little bit about your background and things like that, because, um, well, actually, I'll, I'll start out and just tell how we met. So okay. yeah, I'm a works. pelvic floor physical therapist, as everyone hopefully knows by now. And um, I got an email from you that mm -hmm. you had seen my card at a gym mm -hmm. and saw that I specialize in men and women's pelvic health. And you being a uh, sex therapist uh, reached out to me and then we met up and we had a great conversation. And, you know, I'll let you introduce yourself from here as you did that day. Well, thank you. So, yes, I am Courtney Jeter. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist in the state of Georgia. I'm also a certified sex therapist uh, through the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, uh, otherwise known as ASECT. Uh, so I primarily work with uh, relationships and sexuality concerns or issues. I do a lot of work with men and women uh, around pelvic health, uh, whether there's uh, physical pain or uh, erectile concerns or dysfunction and do refer a lot to pelvic PTs to look at the biomechanical stuff that's going on. I also work with a lot of couples around differences in sexual preferences or desires, you know, try to get things that works for the relationship, you know, or the system. Uh, I also practice as a systems therapist. So one reason why I connect with a lot of healthcare professionals is I see a human being as part of a system, just like the body is its own system with many parts, you know, making it up. That's how I'm assessing a lot of clients in terms of, you know, what, what are their body parts literally doing? And then also as a part in their human systems, what is going on to help them create change? That's great. And, you know, I love that you brought up the, the physical pain that you deal with, you know, that people deal with that you help them through. Uh, from a conservative management standpoint, I mean, you're not putting your hands on them to no. <laughs> pain. So right. uh, can, you, can you tell me a little bit more about that? I know we're going to get into, so the topic is inorgasmia, yeah. but yeah. We're, I, I just kind of want to get a better idea and get the audience to understand a little bit about how you help them through different sections. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely don't touch patients um, or clients. I send them to other medical professionals um, for those type of assessments and treatments. Uh, so all of my work is hands off. It's essentially psychotherapy, just talk psychotherapy, um, you know, looking at sometimes it's just giving someone some education about something they're going through. That's all they need. Or sometimes it's, you know, giving specific suggestions like, hey, go see this pelvic floor PT. Um, you know, you might see some results and then let me know if we need to continue working. Or sometimes there is some intensive therapy to undo some past experiences that might be hindering you know, our current experience with ourself or relationships. Um, so yeah, definitely uh, hands off on, on my end. And if I feel there could be a biomechanical uh, mechanism going on, then I send them to a medical professional, whether it's a physical therapist or their GYN or urologist, just to go ahead and look at medical rollout or even get some lab work done as well. Awesome, yeah. And I mean, it's so incredible how much you can help people with just your words and education. Yeah. How yeah. much does it come down to that, like for you? I have a lot of clients that come in for one or two sessions and it's just after having conversations and getting more information or, you know, hearing something from someone or hearing it in a different way or seeing it in a different way, they don't need intensive therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of times, you know, just one or two sessions can work though for some people they need more sessions like physical therapy probably where you know you might go in and after one session or two sessions you're you know you're functioning how you want to function and there's some people that need some ongoing because of whatever they went through or what their body is you know doing in that moment so very similar with the, the type of work that i do as well that's great yeah and um so you you deal with i mean such a wide array of uh we'll say sexual things i mean you also do uh, work with couples, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I take it that, you know, so we're going to talk about orgasms and inorgasmia, primary and secondary. For those who don't know what uh, primary versus secondary inorgasmia is, primary would be uh, the absence of an orgasm through a lifespan. So having never experienced, and there, there are ranges of definitions, actually. No one's really come mm -hmm. quite agreed upon everything. 
But then secondary inorgasmia would be someone who uh, has attained at some point in their life, but has uh, difficulty attaining one later on in life. Yeah. And one thing that I, I also say is it's hard to, to really know if, you know, if someone has primary inorgasmia is sometimes we have orgasms in our sleep and we don't know it. So, you know, I, I like to say, have you ever had an orgasm in your waking conscious mind that you're aware of, <laughs> you know, or has someone ever told you maybe in your sleep? Because again, sometimes it happens and you don't know. Men sometimes know a little bit more than women. I was say, even, probably just check the bed sheets, I guess. Yeah, but even some <laughs> men, you know, they might have an orgasm without ejaculation. So, you know, and for women, it's just, you know, you could sleep on through it and not realize what's going on, you know, but in your waking mind, you know, we have a lot more anxiety and awareness and that could be hindering the ability to have an orgasm. But if your mind is relaxed, then it's able to do naturally what the body is supposed to do or wants to do. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, I mean, it comes down to that whole, um, uh, sympathetic nervous system so that fight or flight being on and being stressed versus parasympathetic your rest and relaxed nervous system that needs to to be able to uh, get channeled into for those orgasms and yeah you make a great point it's, it's a lot of uh, having to be able to bring yourself mentally down in a way right. yeah. um, and bring it together you know what I'm saying yeah. mm -hmm. um, we have so many stressors in life, don't we? Know, right? Especially right now. I know, right? I know. As, we're, as we're having this conversation during a pandemic, we definitely have so many stressors. Yeah, and, it, and yeah. it's that chronic stress too. Could you imagine mm -hmm. the sensation or the nervous system of, I'm about to be attacked mm -hmm. by a bear, but on constantly and chronically? Right. I mean, but there's no bear that's attacking me. It's just the body and the brain thinks there's a bear that's about to attack exactly. me. And not really. <laughs> so... Yeah, it's, it's, you know, chronic stress is, I think, one of the biggest um, factors for a lot of people that I treat and see, you know, is it's working through the stress and the anxiety versus focusing on the sexual dysfunction that they're coming in with is, you know, is it chicken or egg? Is it a sexual dysfunction or is it that there's chronic stress and you might not be aware of it? Because some people have chronic stress since they were a kid. You know, I've seen clients where when we go as far back as, you know, when they were born, they were under stress. And it's like, well, you've been a very stressed out human being for most of your life. You know, we got to maybe teach your body how not to be stressed out and how to function without stress. You know, and, you know, what can we do to help the body stay in that relaxed state longer than that stress state? Because we're not, we, we need some stress, you know, we need that, that to, in order to function in life in general, but we can't be under it constantly you know or yes sexual dysfunction does happen what types of techniques might you teach someone who who experiences that on a daily basis so honestly i typically go to anxiety management or stress management before i even really jump into trying to change sexual habits because again in my assessment typically it's we need to get the stress under control versus mm -hmm. we need to try to create make the body do something under stress that it's not meant to do. Okay. Um, so sometimes it depends on why someone's coming in. With inorgasmia, I honestly have a conversation first, and I've had a lot of women that will come in, because I typically see more women with inorgasmia than men, um, and men will typically have more secondary inorgasmia with me that all of a sudden something's changed, and I get a lot more women with primary inorgasmia. Um, you know, and so, sometimes, again, I just start the conversation. I just want to understand, you know, what, what their experience is, why they say they're not having an orgasm. You know, has someone told them? Have they read something? Because a lot of times people read books or magazines or they see TV and they see, like, what this orgasm is supposed to be like. And yeah. if that's what you're comparing it to, it might not be reality. Um, so I start with just a conversation and educating you know, and, and talking about orgasms and how, like what an orgasm is, how it functions, how it happens. A lot of women, after we have like one or two conversations, begin to realize that they might actually have been having an orgasm. It just wasn't what they were expecting or what they were reading about or watching in media, you know, and then sometimes the conversation is, okay, what does that mean to you if, you know, if that's not the type of orgasm you're going to have, you know, what is it that you want to achieve and what does orgasm mean to you as well? Um, 
so yeah essentially it's just understanding like are you having an orgasm or are you not and for those and again for a lot of people they realize oh i am and for those who aren't you know i may send them to a pelvic floor pt first just to see you know what is going on with the muscles inside the body that could be impacting the ability for the body to actually have an orgasm you know before i try to start get them to do anything because it might be I make things worse if I try to give them exercises or the body's not able to do it in the current state of its function. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, yeah. the pelvic floor is a functioning, mobile, mm -hmm. uh, you know, part of our body uh, mm -hmm. has muscles and ligaments, just like our legs and arms. And there is a, um, an order in which they need mm -hmm. to be able to contract and relax uh, for those things to happen. And you're absolutely right. Sometimes it takes some of the similar treatment techniques that you might see uh, an athletic trainer helping so, uh, or an athlete with on their legs. You know, there's stretching involved and there's strengthening and you know, muscular development, things like that. But I mean, the, the key is typically the education, the, the mental aspect of it for sure. Yeah, I will have people begin to, to do more diaphragmic breathing or educate on diaphragmic breathing. Um, you know, because again, with anxiety, sometimes we stop breathing. Mm -hmm. um, we cease to breathe or we breathe very slowly or you don't breathe, you breathe very shallowly. Shallow, shallowly, that's not a word. <laughs> Shallow, it is a word now. You know um, what, it'll wind up in the in Webster's Dictionary. Right, right. you know, it's gonna be like 10 years from now, I'll be like, I think I created that word. Google um, made it into the dictionary. Huh? Google's in the dictionary. Google, like, <laughs> to Google it, yeah. <laughs> to Google it? Yeah, that's so, someone like someone, if, if someone like from like 50 years ago read like to Google it, what is the Google? <laughs> Um, and so, uh, but yeah, I'll, I will talk to people about doing more deep diaphragmic breathing and, and discuss the connection between the diaphragm and the pelvic floor. And that's something that, you know, the body naturally, how the body naturally should be doing. Um, but again, I will still send to a PT because there's a reason why we're not breathing. And if we've changed how the body functions, that could change other things and, um, create weakness or, um, lack of strength in, you know, in, in the muscles. But yeah, so I will literally just say, let's, let's just start some breathing exercises. It will help with the anxiety. It'll also help regulate, um, you know, the body's function and get the muscles, the, the pelvic floor muscle functioning as it should. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm really glad you brought up diaphragmatic breathing because uh, there's a, an overwhelming amount of evidence mm -hmm. suggesting that deep diaphragmatic breathing can assist in the regulation of which nervous system is active. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my, my people that I'll wind up working with, I'll have them do diaphragmatic breathing, even if we didn't necessarily find mm -hmm. any uh, muscular abnormalities, any neurologic abnormalities, to get the, the sympathetic nervous system downregulated from the stress of the day, hashtag Atlanta traffic, am I right? right. And, you know, upregulate that parasympathetic nervous system that we, we want and need to be able to ebb and flow in and out of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so badly. Yeah, the gym that, you know, where I found your card, one of the instructors in the class, and she actually has us do that at the end of class. So after we do our cool down and stretching, we take a minute or two or, you know, however much time we have at the end to do actually diaphragmic breathing you know and it's you know even with yoga with shavasana that's you know shavasana is like the let your body take in everything you just did let it rest you know you just did a lot of work and that's a good time to do diaphragmic breathing as well as again it helps switch the body to be okay i can relax now i don't have to just go from this like crazy hard workout to then running into the shower to, you know, try to get into the car to get to work, you know, because now we're still in chronic stress. We're still under a lot of stress. Even though you did something good for your body, we need to let the body have a moment or two, like have it, let it have a break and literally rest, you know? And so I will have a lot of clients just even practice the diaphragm breathing at various times during the day, like after a work meeting or, you know, after the gym or right before bed, you know, just so that way they can begin to get used to what that feels like and hopefully maybe notice some changes as well in their, you know, why they're coming. Like if they're having some incontinence, 
they may notice that, oh, I start using my muscles correctly. That kind of helps with my incontinence a lot. Yeah. Um, or just notice some different like muscle strength going on. That's awesome. And you know what, honestly, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that gym because I, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that place was, I mean, it is amazing the, the message that they have and how educated their, um, their staff uh, is on, on all of these uh, exercise science based things. Right. Uh, Clarity Fitness, right? Was, yeah, Clarity and Decatur. Uh, I'll give them a little shout out right now. Oh, yeah. We love them. <laughs> yeah, no, they're great. Um, yeah. It was honestly one of, one of the reasons I saw one of their, uh, their email ads on their first opening, and mm -hmm. I was just so impressed that I yeah. went in to talk to them. And they, they all totally won me over. So, yeah, I've worked with a lot of people and uh, you know, I really appreciate their their body positivity and then also just education and knowledge of how the body needs to move and function and really putting a lot of focus on form because in, you know, in my own experience and then just like with a lot of clients is posture and form are I think one of the biggest factors of even sexual dysfunction because again, it's just part of the body system. So if we begin to use the body correctly, then you'll begin to notice this domino effect of other things going on. Mm -hmm. you know, I've sent a lot of clients when they've come to see me for one session and I've, I felt there is a, a pelvic floor dysfunction going on of some sort or even just a core issue. Um, I would send them to a pelvic PT and say, come back after you go to a couple of sessions and let me know. And even after a couple of sessions, they've noticed a change in, you know, their erectile functioning or again, like with some of my incontinence or tightness in the vaginal muscles just after one or two sessions, you know, and that's why I'm, I'm very, on, big on collaborating is I can only do so much and you know I might not be the best step the first step for you for, for there to be change it might be someone else and then if there's a disconnect between like the body and the brain now like if the brain is still stuck in oh my gosh I'm being attacked by a bear even though the body is able to function how it needs to that's where I step in and go okay let's help the brain realize we're not being attacked by a bear, that <laughs> this is not going to hurt us anymore. And that's just slowly, you know, reprocessing that experience with the brain to help it function and go, oh, okay, this is actually going to be fun and enjoyable and pleasurable mm -hmm. and not, I have to put my defenses up. Now, what other techniques uh, might you use with some of your clients? I know you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, uh, one uh, or two actually the other day when you and I had talked. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're honestly, those are two of the most well supported by the evidence as, mm -hmm. as it stands and even historically for helping uh, females through primary mm -hmm. and secondary inorgasmia. Do you want to share a little bit about those? Well, if we're on the same page, because I know we had like a two hour talk. <laughs> we talked about a lot. <laughs> well, it's, it's, um, well, it's so natural. So I'll, I'll just say it so you don't know, <laughs> sensate focus. Okay, right? yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was like, you talk yeah. about my sensate focus and my touch. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so I do <clears throat> some sensate focus uh, with clients. And um, I don't necessarily use the original sensate focus um, technique or steps. It has evolved over the decades. So I always tell clients when I give you this assignment, don't go and Google because <laughs> you might get something completely different than what I gave you. Yeah. Um, and I, I assign it based on who is sitting in front of me or the relationship in front of me, if it's a relationship I'm working with. And we go from there that this is, you know, it's, it's unique to, to who I am in front of at that moment, not just, well, these are the steps you have to follow because that's what someone said, you know, yeah. 30 years ago. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so sensate focus is essentially it, the, the, the ultimate, um, concept of it is you remove the pressure of penetration and orgasm essentially because a lot of people come in with this there has to be penetration and I have to have an orgasm or everyone has to have an orgasm and so then that creates the stress and the anxiety and the body doesn't naturally function sexually have sexual functioning when it's under stress um, and anxiety um, that's the complete opposite, actually. So we want to remove that so that way people can begin to actually enjoy the experience without that pressure. Um, typically in the exercise, um, it's about 10 minutes for each round. Uh, I shorten that for some people to maybe two to five minutes the first time, because 10 minutes can be a really, 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 really long time for some people, especially if they have a lot of stress. So two minutes might just be enough to get a taste of what it's like. And then you can always add on, you know, more, more time 
um, if you want later on, or just keep it at the two minutes. Um, so essentially, each if, when I'm working with a couple, each person can be with whatever level of comfort of clothing that they want, whether they have, you know, I say loose, loose clothing is probably best, um, but as much clothing or little clothing as they want. Um, typically we'll say maybe keep as a client uh, described one time in session, uh, avoid the bathing suit area. So maybe keep on like, you know, something to cover the, the core. So the, um, the genital areas, the butt, the, the chest. So that way there's, not much temptation, but it's almost like a barrier as well. It's like, oh, there's something covering I can't touch. Okay. Um, and, and then start, they start with just touch. One person goes first and touches. The other person is receiving the touch. There is no communication, no talking in the, the exercise. I will talk with them about creating a safe word or a safe gesture. If someone has like panic and they can't speak or move, they can communicate in some way to their partner that they need, we need to stop and um, you know, do some anxiety or de-escalation with pan for the panic. But other than that, there's no communication because the focus really is to focus on what am I feeling in the moment and what do I, how am I aware of my partner a lot? Um, and that's why I also say two to five minutes might be more reasonable is that's a lot to try to remember. Um, so it gives you some time to have that experience and then have a, a mini break, write down some notes for yourself go into the second round and you switch roles and then you know you can talk about it afterwards so during the the time frame a lot of time you know each person is doing their role they're touching they're becoming aware of what i'm feeling aware of what my my partner's feeling the partner receiving again is taking in the touch seeing like what does that spot feel like versus this spot becoming aware of okay am i you know going through my mind with lots of thoughts am i you know grounded to this moment um, am I having thoughts about what my partner is thinking? Am I, you know, going to, did I get the dishes done? So really <laughs> creating that awareness of like, what are you really going through without that pressure of having to go to the quote, the next step. Um, and so for some people, I actually limit them to only touch like maybe their elbows down to their hand or their knee down to their foot. Oh, that's like 1800 uh, status, right? Yeah, like, yeah. We're like, yeah, we, we depending on, very provocative. Yeah, yeah. We're, you know, depending on like how much, you know, pressure and anxiety we have going on, um, sometimes, you know, we really need to take away a lot of, you know, space. So that way we just focus on the, the here and the now and not trying to plan ahead for the next thing. Um, for some couples, you know, where it's more of a, we're just trying to help them reconnect in a different way. We can go above the elbow. Eventually, everyone goes above the elbow and above the knee, but it's also like what the comfort level is. Um, for some couples where maybe one partner hasn't had much control or been able to like use their voice for whatever reason, I may also have them be the one to initiate the exercise. So that way they have a little bit more control in the beginning of what's going on as well. Um, so I also use this exercise just with individuals a lot of women mostly, but sometimes men, because a lot of men can be unaware and ungrounded when they're having a sexual experience with a partner. Um, and so I'll actually do the same exercise, but it's just with their own self-touch. You're literally just doing the same thing. You just don't have another partner to worry about, but you're touching yourself. Um, you know, and again, you can start with like elbow down, or it could just be during someone's self-play, solo play, masturbating of, you know, what are you really feeling, but, you know, maybe touching what does this part of, you know, my, my labia feel like versus the inside of my thigh, um, touching now, other when, body parts. Mm -hmm. When you say, what does it feel like? Do you mean like they're trying to assess what it feels like to the labia or the, to the touch of their hand? Uh, probably both. It could be both. Yeah, it could be both. It's more of just, again, what do you feel? How does that feel to you? You know, it, you know, if you had to put it on a scale of zero to five, you know, is this a five or is this like a zero? Is it a dud or is it, oh my gosh, that's like really awesome. Um, and again, it's also encouraging someone to you to touch different body parts that they might not normally touch in their self play to see what does that feel like when I touch it versus if a partner has ever touched there or maybe a partner hasn't and maybe that's a spot that they'd be like, hey partner, this feels really good to me. This is a five. This is a way to get me going. You know, and the point of this exercise is really to get the person more aware of their own body, their own experience, and be able to communicate to other people. And I've had a lot of couples where they've come and they've, they've um, or couples or individuals, and they've done this exercise, 
And they said, oh yeah, I noticed there's a lot of other spots on my body that I wasn't aware of before that felt really good. So it gave them more of a canvas to work with versus just going straight to, you know, the penis, straight to the, the vagina, straight to the clitoris. So it's like, hey, we have, a, we have a whole other organ that we're just ignoring over here that could enhance sexual pleasure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the, the one I typically, I, I give a lot of folks sort of in the beginning sometimes, or maybe after we've had a couple of sessions. And again, depending on, you know, what they're bringing to, to our conversation and what their experience is, we modify it as needed. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you ever have them bring in, like if they have a toy of some sort uh, at home, would, would you have them bring it in? Uh, would you make a suggestion to them? I definitely make suggestions. I definitely have um, toys that I have in my office that are on display. They're demo toys, um, but they're there for that reason. So that way people can touch them, can feel them, um, get an idea of like, you know, a lot of people have never actually held a sex toy. They've never gone to a sex toy shop. They've never ordered one. So they don't know what they're like. They've never, you know, even used lube, you know, so I have, you know, lube samples. Um, so oh, yeah, I give, I give lube samples out like, yeah. Halloween. Candy. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like it's like pretty much Halloween, you know, 365 days in my office. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I want people to be able to, again, come in and have an experience and, and get information that they might not normally or they haven't. Um, and so sometimes I will suggest certain toys. Um, I have a demo of the magic wand or sometimes called the Hitachi wand. Um, it is an external vibrator, essentially, you know, but it's also really good just to get blood flow and relaxed muscles. So sometimes, um, and it doesn't create as much sensitivity to the clitoral area as well as some other vibrating toys can. So sometimes it's a good way to also just sort of like, quote, warm up the muscles, um, you know, but to relax them a little bit before doing any kind of play. Um, I mean, most vibrating toys can do that. This one just happens to have a little bit more of an intensity and can get deeper into the muscle. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'll show a lot of women that where I know there's some tightness and I'll, I'll even say, hey, if you're seeing a PT, ask them if they think this would be something that you could, you know, add into your, you know, that you could use to help um, massage muscles a little bit as well. Um, but yeah, I'll show, you know, cock rings to a lot of men, um, use the toys. Sometimes when we get to various steps in the touch exercises, I give I'll even say, hey, bring in, you know, objects, bring in a, a, a small bullet just to get some vibration or a feather or even sometimes ice. Um, coldness can really create, you know, a sensation for some people. So I encourage people to also like, again, once they get used to being with each other, like try adding some, some objects safely, please, yeah. you know, but, you know, try adding objects because you never know like what it might feel like, like a different sensation with a feather versus a finger or even like with ice versus vibration and you might realize like wow i really like that or that feels really you know good um so um so clients i don't know i don't know if i've ever had anyone ever bring in a toy um i will ask them what they use or if they bring one up and i can typically google it um in office and talk about it so they don't necessarily need to bring it in you know and they wouldn't use it in office so there's really not a point for them to bring it in um, that way, but if it was something like they weren't sure how to use it, then again, I can probably Google that. And if I wasn't sure, I would say, sure, bring it in and we'll kind of figure it out. Because yeah, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of sex toys don't come with very explicit instructions. You kind of have to figure right. it out yourself. <laughs> Your imagination, um, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. I've, I've, I've had a few before where I'm just like, I think this goes here. You're like, you know, <laughs> It's like um, a piece of Ikea furniture, but- Right, we, yeah, it's like, it's like oh, we don't, even, we don't even get um, illustrations to figure out how this is. <laughs> it's like, okay, like the video on the website was kind of helpful, but not really. Um, so, you know, so sometimes, you know, we can just talk about the toy. If they tell me what it is, I can look at it online and get an idea of, you know, how they might be able to use it um, and give suggestions that way. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. And you know what? Something you brought up to me uh, the other day that mm -hmm. um, I feel like is a good thing to bring up now that we've been talking about this a little bit more is that masturbation, sex, and foreplay are mm -hmm. all okay. And you mentioned uh, how some people, you just need to give them permission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did I get that right? Like some people just yeah. really need that permission from someone else. Mm -hmm. 
know that it is okay and people do yeah. do this. You're not weird or different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a part of one of the models that I, I use a lot is the Plicit model. Uh, and that, that people can Google. You can find some great stuff on Plicit, um, YouTube videos, readings. Um, and uh, essentially, it's the first, um, the first part is if you give permission to somebody, um, this model was created by Jack Anan in, I think, 1975. Don't hold me to the year, but a few I'll let days. it slide yeah. if it was 1974, but not a year. <laughs> right, yeah, right. So it was 1970 something. I'm pretty sure it was 1975. Um, and so um, it's a model that he essentially said if you give, the first part is permission. The second part is limited information. Um, the third is specific suggestions. And then the last is intensive therapy. And that spells plicit, essentially. And what he found was that mo most people, when you give them permission, that makes things better for them. They're, they're quote, cured. They're healed. They know, oh, I can go do this. Um, this is all right for me to do. So, oh, it's okay for me to masturbate. Okay, I'll go masturbate. And now I'm enjoying sex and I'm having a great sex life with my partner, I don't need any more, you know, education or counseling or therapy. Um, some people need some limited information. So, you know, there are a lot of people, I've worked with a lot of um, people from other countries, a lot of refugees or people who um, immigrated over to the U.S. or even just people from, you know, in, inside the United States who don't get good sex ed and they don't know how their body works. And so sometimes it's just you know, telling them how their body functions. And when they begin to understand, you know, that, then it's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So they don't need anything. They got the permission, they got some information, and now they're good to go. Um, then there's some people who need some suggestions. So maybe, have you tried doing this? Um, or I think you should go to a PT, that might help you a little bit more. Or um, have you had your labs checked? I wonder if that would give us some information about what might be going on. Um, so giving them suggestions of things that might help. And then there's a very, 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 very small population of people, of clients who actually need intensive therapy. And so what I even mean, I found in my, my practice is most clients don't actually need the intensive therapy. Most clients just need the, the permission, the limited information, and maybe the specific suggestions at times, and then they're good. Um, and, a, and a small population need that really intense therapy due to a really traumatic experience um, or really high anxiety or panic, um, a lot of conflict in the relationship where we really need to stop and unpack and go a little bit deeper, emotionally deeper um, than the others. So that's the original Plicit model. They, they did update it and um, it, now there's the extended version, which they called explicit. Oh. Kind of <laughs> yeah. Um, and essentially what it just says is that it, 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 each step needs to be given permission. So we need to be giving permission um, that the permission part is sort of like the core of it all, not like the first step. So it's more of like instead of a step based model, it's just sort of a it's a it's a cycle kind of, I guess. It's kind of like the grief where we, we found that grief doesn't happen in these stages. It actually can happen, you know, at whatever time it needs to, and it can repeat. So we don't really go through the grief stages anymore. We just talk about the grief cycle or the grief experience that you may experience these. Um, and so that's essentially what the extended um, model is just different is that they're saying that no, for certain populations that we work with, we actually need to be giving permission in each of the stages or the each step, um, you know, versus the first thing and the, the only time we do it. So, so yeah, so I, um, I found that just sometimes again, giving permission to clients was all they needed. Um, I started doing sex toy parties as well. Um, it's sort of your pure romance with your high school, you know, sex ed combined, um, but a lot more fun, a lot more, you know, intimate, like in your home or with your friends. Um, you know, you can, you know, have your, your beverages and your snacks, you know, try to have some kind of like fun little icebreaker games as well. Um, and I, the reason I started that was I, I found that a lot of people were coming to me and really just needing either the permission or like the information. And that was all they needed. And I was like, well, you don't need to come to a sex therapist to get that, you just know, sex toy party. Yeah, yeah. Why not do this with your friends? Like let's educate, you know, a bunch of people at one time. And, you know, especially a lot of women, they like to have fun, you know, girls nights, you know, or great for bachelorettes or, um, 
even doing couples parties. You know, so I actually started doing what I call, I call them papaya parties, uh, just for that reason where I'm just like, why don't you pay me to come and you can be in the comfort of your own home with your friends or, you know, partners and, you know, you get to, you know, kind of have like a sex toy party, but I'm bringing high quality products, safe, body safe products, really educating on how to use the products, even telling some people, I don't think you need to use this. If you're telling me you have sensitivity to stuff, don't use this product. And this is why, you know, or talk to your doctor first to see if this is something that they would recommend that you use. Um, so it's, it's definitely, they're fun, but a lot more education based than just here, buy this product that you don't know how to use. And we don't really know where it was made or where it came from. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I, I love that idea, especially since uh, just from my own experience in working with people uh, through orgasmic dysfunctions, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times the report back uh, by the end of our time together will be, oh, I went and I, you know, told my friends about it now that I'm comfortable with it and I'm doing much better sexually uh, to their own standard. Mm -hmm. um, and I found out that they were all having, or, or one or two of them, you know, whatever, were having a similar um, frustration, we'll say. So uh, it's, it's great that you do that group setting because, mm -hmm. again, it just, it, it makes it okay. It makes it that, you know, we're all on the same page. We're all in this <laughs> together. I just love the power in numbers kind of thing. Right, yeah. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah, and I mean, for gen in general, a lot of women tend to talk with each other, probably more than a lot of men. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, so. We, we keep to ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot. I mean, there's there's some men who, uh, they, they do chat with each other, but, you know, you're not really, you know, going and grabbing beer or playing golf and saying, you know, hey, man, has, has your penis ever done this thing? <laughs> you know, women, on the other hand, you know, at least me, my friends and I were like, have you ever, like, has this happened to you? <laughs> like, I read this article, like, do you know? So, you know, and again, it's, it's, it's one of those, it's a space where it's comfortable. You know, it, you can be in your own home. You don't have to go to the, quote, like a doctor's office. I mean, mm -hmm. my office is definitely not a doctor's office. It's set up like you'd be in like a living room or something, um, minus the sex toys, you know, <laughs> at the doorway. Um, yeah, I guess you wouldn't keep that on display. And I mean, some people might, but you know, <laughs> I, mean, I definitely had sex toys laying around my, my home before because I was doing a work, something and I'm like people definitely came in were like I'm like don't ask and oh like, yeah I mean if you saw my my computer history just from like I know right like, I don't even care anymore I used to when I started right. out I, I would like uh what's it called you did the private like searches yeah like, the, uh, the, incognito. yeah and I got to a point where it was just so much trouble was, whatever this is what I do I'm, I'm just yeah I'm, I'm like <laughs> if you're on my computer you're probably on it for a really bad reason so you have to go through and see all of like the sex stuff that I googled and brought up and that's true you know this is just this is karma karma coming back for you being on my computer and probably not and if you're on my computer with permission then you know you're probably going to see stuff and and there it is permission yet again yeah there seems to be permission to be on my computer but just knowing that something might pop up that might be surprising um so um but yeah so uh that's uh, yeah again kind of going back to the the permission and numbers you know it it really helps. It really works a lot of when I've done a lot of the parties with women, you know, most are pretty open in general, but by the end of the night, I mean, or in the, not in the night, I'm there for like an hour, an hour and a half, you know, they're really, you know, reading questions from the card game I bought or talking more with each other about like one of the products that I brought or, uh, you know, so it's, I think it just creates like this, oh, it's okay to talk about this because a lot of us get messages early on that we can't talk about that stuff. Um, you know, we're not allowed to say names like body parts or um, products. It's like that stuff that helps or like down there. And, you know, here it's this is an environment where we can use, you know, we can use body part names and call a labia a labia and a penis a penis and, and you know, whatever else you want to, you know, call it. I, I don't say a penis ring. I do say a cock ring. But, mm -hmm. you know, it can be either. <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I, I was just thinking, as you said, like saying the words in, I want to say it was high school. I can't remember if it was zoology or anatomy class, but I'm actually leaning more towards zoology. The fact that you had zoology in high school is amazing. So It, it was amazing. It was pretty awesome. They had a bunch yeah. of animals, turtles, and, and an, they had a, an anaconda, a python, like something really big. I don't, what high school did you go to? <laughs> 
Uh, Port Jefferson High School in New York. <laughs> oh, oh, New York. Okay. That's what I must say. But like, the South definitely would not have an anaconda or a python in there. Well, you guys know. just go in the woods, right? And, and it's all there. That's your... Pretty much, yeah. Live, live zoology. No, I'm just kidding. Right. We, we just have copperheads down here, so... <laughs> oh, yeah. People love to talk about the copperhead. It's yeah. <laughs> scary sounding. But uh, at any rate, we had to get up on the first day of class, each one of us, and say penis and vagina... <laughs> and not laugh for 10 seconds. Otherwise we failed. We got like a failing <laughs> test grade. for the beginning. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you were serious. Some people, some people lost, like they got their, their F, but yeah, oh. no, that, that, that was my introduction to saying penis and vagina in front of people on a regular basis. Yeah. I went, when I went to um, undergrad, there was a popular sexology course and I mean, it packed out. Like it was literally standing room only like the first, um no masks uh, huh no masks no 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 no, no no this was this was long before masks were even you know <laughs> of. um and the first so and so also like you had this like you know packed out you know like what 20 like 18 to 22 year olds probably um in this room and waiting for the professor to come in and i swear to god this like 70 or 80 year old guy walks in and we're all like this is our professor who's teaching our sex class and the first thing he says is just to yell out all of the names of the male anatomy that we can think of like you know like street names slang you know proper names whatever whatever comes to mind yell it out so of course you have like you know a room of like what 20 30 you know people um yelling it out and then you know it, it quiets down and he had like a whiteboard and I'm, i guess maybe like he got probably two, three columns of, you know, good, you know, there's a, there's a, a good, bit. and this guy starts writing more and adding more columns. Like, oh. well, I guess you've literally heard it all. And then we did the same thing for the female anatomy. And it was just like, okay, like one, it was like, these go by a lot of names that a lot of us don't even know. But again, like in a room full of people having to refer to genitalia in some form or fashion, and it can be like really uncomfortable. Um, yeah, when I, I when with, when I work with clients, I try to use their language first, mm. and then slowly introduce, you know, uh, body parts like proper names, so that way they can again that permission of I'm using this and it's okay for you to use this as well. And this is what it's called because you know when people come in, they're like, yeah, it kind of hurts down there. And I'm like, well, down there is actually there's a lot down there, so. <laughs> You know, if you're going to your doctor saying it hurts down there, that's hard to, you know, what hurts down there. Um, right. So it's, it's really, you know, going saying, okay, well, you know, we have different parts of, of the female genitalia. There's your labias. You have, you know, sometimes you have two labias that, that could be of different sizes. Is that where it hurts? Or is it, you know, more further in, like at the opening of the vagina where like you would begin to insert a tampon if you use tampons? Or is it after you've inserted a tampon or like after an object, a penis, a toy or something is inside, they trying to really help them be able to better describe like where things don't feel good. Cause again, if someone is getting information but they're thinking something different, they might be treating it differently than what needs to be treated. And it also, hopefully I think helps clients that begin, typically begin to use, you know, uh, Lay, proper names and labels of body parts as we talk you know and my my goal is hopefully that if you can use it with me you can go to this other person and you know clearly describe as well what yeah. what you're going through yeah communication definitely is key i mean just mm -hmm. knowing the lingo and how to communicate to i guess if you ever went to another um healthcare professional and you needed yeah. to communicate with them yeah absolutely yeah so that's great yeah um and I wanted to actually just touch back on some masturbation talk. Uh, yeah. for a minute. We talked about it a little bit the other day, you know, kind of getting in front of a mirror, just because it's something that mm -hmm. our audience, if uh, they were just listening, yeah. they could easily try yeah. it on their own. Oh, yeah. Um, sensei focus is something that, you know, you really would probably mm -hmm. need a professional to help with, but directed masturbation is something that, that typically mm -hmm. once you hear about it, learn about it, read about it, you could at least try it on your own safely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And with the, the sensate focus, you know, there are definitely lots of books out there and there's great, you know, information that 
you know, people can use like activities they can do at home. It's just, if it's not going well, Mm -hmm. that's when you definitely need to get a professional involved or if there's just a lot of conflict. A lot of that is also about communication. So if we're not communicating very well with a partner, um, then it may not be a great experience. And that's where, again, the, the work with the professional may be more about communication versus doing the sexual thing. Um, but yeah, with like the guided or directed masturbation, a lot of times I have, you know, women more than men because, you know, men can look down and see their genitals. Yeah, it's just there. <laughs> yeah, it's there. It's, I mean, you can't miss it most of the time. Um, women, we can't. Um, it's just, you know, get a mirror and, you know, check yourself out, like sit on the floor or the toilet or wherever's comfortable, your bed, um, bathroom, and just sort of see like, what does your, you know, your labia look like? You know, can you identify body parts? Like look at, you know, a a diagram, medical diagram and see like, okay, what is that? Oh, that's that. I've even had with some clients with them in session, we just literally Google like images of labias and be like, let's look at all the different labias that we have out there. You know, they're, they're all different, you know, so yeah, yeah. you might think yours looks weird, but I, I mean, they're like, what it's like weird? a snowflake, so, right? Like mm-hmm. everyone is, every, there's no one that looks alike, right? Just like, yeah, a snowflake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's one of those where I'll, I'll ask someone, I'll go, okay, how many, you know, how many vaginas, labias, penises have you seen? And do they all look the same? Probably not. So that's, that's going to be the same for you as yours is not going to look like somebody else's more than likely, you know, and it, it's talking a little bit about like, what is it like to, when you look at your genitalia? Cause again, for a lot of women, we don't see it. We're not growing up looking down every day, seeing our genitalia. It's, it's hidden from us. And then we're not allowed to talk about it. And then we're not taught, you know, proper names and terminology. So then all of a sudden it's like, we're supposed to be able to use this and it's supposed to be fun and I'm supposed to be connected with it yet. I've not ever had a relationship with it. So sometimes it's just sit down there and, you know, take a look, have a conversation if you so want to. Um, I'll have, you know, clients write about or journal or write a letter to mm-hmm. however they, they want to, um, you know, get their thoughts out on paper and we'll just talk about their experience. You know, and then it's like, if you want, begin to touch. I mean, not not be touching in a sexual way, like you're aroused, but just like, again, like, okay, what does this feel like? What does that feel like? Like, oh, that pinching, that happens often when I sit down or when my partner does. Now I get what that is. So sometimes, again, it's just informing yourself about your own body and experience. Um, And that's a simple exercise. It's also like, well, I have clients um, where there might be some other body image concerns as just stand in the mirror and look at yourself naked or get ready like naked. Hmm. Like don't put like a shirt on, don't put, you know, a towel around you, like literally put your makeup on, do your hair, shave, whatever, however men get ready, you know, (laughs) 10 minutes versus, you know, Um, but yeah, do it naked. And what is it like for you to, you know, be in front of that mirror with yourself, like seeing yourself, you know, as you are, you know, versus you cover yourself up. And sometimes again, it's just the, the more you do it, the more you become comfortable with something that you're not, there's no fear around it. It's like, and for a lot of people they are like, I don't really know what I was concerned about in the first place. It's like, you were concerned because you were told not to do something. So you didn't do it. And every time you have to like take your clothes off in the dressing room or to get in the shower, there's this, that fear comes back from being told I can't do this, but yet I'm doing it. Yeah, no, that's great. And you know, what? actually that was, uh, I remember a public speaking technique ish, not necessarily <laughs> getting naked in front of the mirror, but you practice right. yeah. when you're doing your speech. So you see what you look like and mm-hmm. you know, I don't, I, I do, do look normal. I do, you know, I, I do appreciate the way I'm presenting or uh, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? But yeah, no, I, I love that concept. I never would have thought to have mm-hmm. brought it to uh, sexual health. Uh, that's yeah. a great idea. Yeah, but it's, it's all a part. Sexual health, sexual wellness is, again, connecting to your body. And a lot of times people come with a sexual concern. But the work I do with people isn't always about doing sex. It's a lot mm-hmm. of times uh, what we have to do before we do sex. Because if you're going to be naked with yourself and then another human being, at least, well, you got to be comfortable with yourself. If you're not, you're going to be in your head 
and thinking about what is this person thinking versus if you're comfort if you're if you're comfortable and confident you don't really care right yeah absolutely or care as much maybe <laughs> <laughs> So. That's true. But yeah, I know that confidence factor is such key. Mm -hmm. um, feeling good about yourself. And yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Did you have anything else that you wanted to, <laughs> to share in, in terms of like sexual health, things like that? I mean, this has been such a great conversation. Um, I, I'd, I'd hate to, for it to end. <laughs> I know I got to let you go, though. Um, but yeah, no, I, I mean, yeah, is there anything, um, any last minute uh, pieces of advice, like take home messages or things for people to try, like that you want to yeah. summarize that we talked about? I think, you know, one of the biggest things for me is like, you know, it's all about your mindset. And sometimes if we see things in a negative way, then we're probably going to have a more negative experience versus if we see things in like a positive way, we might have a more positive experience. And I mean, the psychology of positive thinking in general has really proven that just thinking positively about something really helps some someone's um, I guess satisfaction or um, enjoyment level or their experience you know and so I learned from actually a chiropractor years ago and I, I tried to pass this on and I connected to sexual health is you know she taught about sick care versus well care that we live in a society around sick care that you have to be sick in order to go to the doctor um, versus you can go to the doctor when you feel good because you're taking care of yourself and that's well care is I want to make sure I'm still taking care of myself even though I don't feel sick you know I might benefit from again just getting information or maybe I see something something comes out in lab work that we can take care of sooner than later and so that's well care and I like to use it with with um, clients and around sexual health is you know we have sexual health which to me is just like your broad you know what makes up your sexual being your sexual experience then we have sexual wellness, which I feel is more like a well care. And it's, I want to make sure that sexually I am, I'm good, that I'm taken care of and that can be preventative. Like, even if you're not sure, even if you don't really feel like there's much, just, you know, go to the doctor and make sure, you know, go to a physical therapist, make sure everything's all right. Maybe they might find something that you didn't realize you were experiencing and that can help change your experience or going to therapy with the mindset of, I don't have to be quote broken or have a really horrible relationship. Maybe I just want to explore more about myself and my own sexuality to improve my experiences with myself and with other people before it gets to the point where we have that quote, we're sick now. Right. Um, so yeah, so really looking at, you know, sex therapy or sex education can just be about getting more information and who knows what that might do for you, you know, just in general daily life. And then if you know, have a connection with the provider, if something does come up, they already know more about you. And it's just starting with what's going on in that moment without having to kind of understand who you are in this moment of crisis. Right. So. That's, that's kind of my last little tidbit is yeah that's change great your mindset a little bit what's that change your mindset a little bit you know it it helps you know i think it changes you know how you respond to things and react to things as well if it comes from a more positive perspective or outlook than like a negative one and and that is a great closing note because i mean it really does tie in i mean what we've been talking about with mm -hmm. like just the stresses and the you know relaxing and things like that to, yeah. to get to your your sexual satisfaction essentially so that, that that is a great ending note and i really do appreciate that and yeah time. well thank you if someone wanted to get a hold of you mm -hmm. what would they do how would they, they yeah one of the best ways <laughs> uh tick tock what do you got i know right um so i am definitely like social media um uh, conservative uh, I actually have an intern who, who does most of my social media because I'm like, I just don't have time. Uh, but yeah, the best way is you, they can check out our website, um, sextherapistatl.com. I also have an associate and interns who work underneath me. So people could definitely contact me or they can work with someone underneath me um, as well. They are all training in sexual health and sex therapy as well as general therapy. Um, if someone wanted to email me directly, it's just Courtney at sextherapistatl.com. So can send an email. Um, also on Instagram at sex therapist uh, ATL. And I think Facebook is sex therapy ATL, I believe. Um, 
their algorithm would not let me use sex therapist because I guess the word the rapist was in there. So yeah, oh. yeah, therapist spells the rapist, unfortunately. Yeah, it's kind of, I, no, I'm not, yeah. So Facebook's algorithm nice. wouldn't, I, I, <laughs> yeah, at first I thought it was the word sex and I'm like, really Facebook, could you please come into the modern century? And then when I tried something else with um, therapist, it wouldn't let me do it. And I was like, oh, their algorithm is pulling that those two words that are combined. Right, right. Um, okay. huh. but anyway, it's just a bit of tidbit. Uh, yeah. So you can vet the Instagram probably has a little bit more information. Um, and then also on LinkedIn as well at just, um, Courtney Jeter, LMFT as well. So can you spell your name way. for, for the yeah. audience? Yeah. Um, so last, oh, so first name is C O U R T N E Y. And last name is G E T E R. It's like the baseball player, but with a G. Yeah. That's why I want no to relation. So <laughs> If only, right? Right, I know, right? That'd be great, like, you know. <laughs> Get to go to, yeah, some pretty swanky parties, I bet. I was about to say, like, some nice, you know, baseball games. So, yeah, no no relation, unfortunately, and different spelling. Yeah. So, but yeah, thank you so much. This was a great conversation. I hope, um, I hope people get some good information from it. Um, oh, they definitely did. I, I, you did a great job, and I, I really appreciate it. I'm sure of course. they appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you for making the time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'm going to go probably enjoy it by the pool since it's, you know, the dog days of summer right now. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's so true. Well, thanks again, Courtney. Of course. Talk soon. Bye.